Here's yet another video, and what we're going to be talking about right now is state court assertions of personal jurisdiction, or I should say, state court assertions of jurisdictions over property. So we're talking in rem jurisdiction and quasi in rem jurisdiction. Okay, keep in mind that this analysis also applies to federal courts to the extent that you can use Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 4 and 2. All right, analyzing jurisdiction over property in state court. Well, first you've got to ask is there a state rule or statute? that permits the seizure of the property, okay? So there, look for uh, facts that tell you what sort of state law is being used to seize or control or garnish the property, okay? Uh, second, we have to do the constitutional analysis. Does the 14th Amendment permit uh, the seizure? Now, we go back here for a moment, just a moment, to the first principle of public law uh, under Penoyer. As you recall, the first principle of public law under Penoyer said that a state has exclusive jurisdiction over persons and property uh, within the state. Uh, however, it's not clear to the extent that that is still good law regarding property. Under Penoyer, if the property was in the state, then the, the state courts had jurisdiction over that property. But now we have to think about the Schaffer versus Heitner case. And in that case, uh, a majority opinion authored by Justice Marshall uh, put down a, a, a framework and told us to use uh, uh, the International Shoe Minimum Contacts Test for all assertions of state court jurisdiction, which would include jurisdiction over property. Okay, and he gave us four different scenarios and suggested to us how each might be analyzed. The first would be a pure in rem. In rem jurisdiction is when the property is the subject matter of the suit and the whole world is bound, such as a probate proceeding. Okay? Uh, just as Marshall said, in such a case, there would usually be jurisdiction over the property found within the state. He also talked about a quasi in rem type 1 proceeding, which is when the property is within the state, the property is the subject matter of the lawsuit, but the only litigants being bound would be the plaintiff and the defendant. Again, he said that would usually be the case. Think, for example, of a suit between a seller of, of a house and a buyer of a house, and the uh, seller doesn't want to close on the property, but the buyer wants to enforce the sales agreement. Well, that would be an in rem type one, and Marshall says usually there's going to be PJ. The other types of um, in rem, the other types of jurisdiction are quasi in rem, type 2A and 2B, and that's when the relationship between the property and the suit is more tenuous. Okay, let's talk about a quasi in rem type a 2A. That's when the property is related to the suit, but the property itself is not the, the subject of the suit. So imagine a slip and fall on somebody's land, and you fall and hurt yourself, and then you sue the owner of that land um, in tort, okay? Well, you're not suing them to obtain possession of the property. Instead, what you're doing is suing for negligence. Now, there is a relationship between the property and the suit. Namely, it's the property is both evidence of the suit and the but-for cause of the suit. But it's not the subject matter of the suit. The subject matter here is negligence arising from the landowner's failure to exercise proper care. Right? That's a quasi in rem type 2A. And what Marshall says, maybe there's PJ. So it's going to depend. More contacts might help. But in some cases, maybe the presence of the land would be enough. However, the facts of Schaffer fell under what Marshall said is a quasi in rem type 2B situation, which is when the property is not the subject matter of the suit and is completely unrelated to the suit. Okay, think of, for example, the stock in the suit. The majority said that stock had nothing to do with the suit, which is a suit against principals from the Greyhound Corporation uh, and another corporation for mismanagement that caused Greyhound to lose millions of dollars in actions that happened in another state. Okay, and the court said the property had nothing to do whatsoever with the suit. What Marshall said was, in such a scenario, there's no PJ without more. You would need more contacts. Okay? So according to Marshall, that's how you would analyze. Look at the, the, the property and its relation to the suit. And then analyze using minimum contacts test. So in that sense, we could arguably say that um, the first principle of public law is history regarding property. The states don't have absolute power over property within the state. The problem with that is that the property in uh, Schaffer was a quasi-assertion of jurisdiction over intangible property, stocks and stock options. 
And in several notable concurrences, uh, two of the justices uh, argued that the uh, uh, rule of Penoyer of automatic power over property within the state should remain good law regarding real property. Okay? It, so, after Schaffer, the law was unsettled. And we're going to talk in another part in a separate video about what Burnham said. Um, basically, for purposes of this video, um, after Schaffer and after Burnham, there's a strong argument that can be made for both sides. If you take the Marshall position, then any property, whether real property or not, is to be analyzed under the minimum contacts test. However, under these two concurrences, you have the strong counterargument to make that regarding real property, uh, Penoyer's first principle of public law is still good law, and there will be automatic jurisdiction over real property found uh, within the state. Um, further discussion of the implications of Burnham, um, I'll save for a future uh, uh, part of this set of videos. Thank you.